Welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for the second installment of this fall seminar series hosted by, by the Stavros Niarchos Foundation Center for Hellenic Studies and generally generously co-sponsored by the Department of Gender, Sexuality and Women's Studies, as well as the Department of World Languages and Literatures at Simon Fraser University. For those of you joining the seminar series, the SNF seminar series for the first time, uh, note that each year we invite leading international scholars working in different aspects of Hellenic studies to present their research on a wide range of topics in the fields of archaeology, classics, Byzantine, Ottoman, and modern Greek history, as well as literary and cultural studies. Before we begin, I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge that this event was organized at Simon Fraser University on Burnaby Mountain which is located on the unceded traditional territories of the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, Musqueam, and Coquitlam peoples. Before I introduce today's presenter, I would like to remind everyone that this webinar is being recorded. If you have any questions or concerns about SFU's Zoom privacy and security guidelines, please visit the SFU IT services website. I would like to make an additional note, we're experiencing minor issues with the network connection, please bear with us. It's a pleasure to uh, present our speaker, uh, Dr. Raphael Cormack. Dr. Cormack has a PhD in Egyptian theater from the University of Edinburgh. He has edited two collections of short stories translated from Arabic, the book of Khartoum and the book of Cairo. He's also a writer on Arabic culture and his work has appeared in the London Review of Books, Times Literary Supplement, the LA Review of Books and elsewhere. Midnight in Cairo, The Divas of Egypt's Roaring Twenties is his latest book publication. Uh, welcome, Dr. Cormac. We look forward to your presentation. Hello, hello. Hi, I'm just going to share uh, my screen with PowerPoint uh, and Okay, great. Hope that's uh, working well for everyone. The sound is good. Uh, all the rest of it. Thanks very much um, for the introduction and thanks very much for having me. I really sort of wish I could be here, there, wherever it is in person uh, and hopefully soon, soon I'll be able to. But for now, we'll have to make do as always with Zoom. Um, so my, this talk is, is really about my latest book, uh, Midnight in Cairo. Uh, and that is an attempt to tell the story of the 1920s and 30s in Egypt through the lens of uh, the women who really controlled its nightlife scene. So, you know, cabaret owners, singers, uh, actresses, theatre troupe owners, impresarias, th this kind of thing. And to tell a sort of different aspect of that story to one that we're really used to. Um, and I'm very happy to talk about that in general, about the uh, about the story of uh, you know how to write women's lives into 20th century history, particularly in Egypt. Um, but I, for this sort of presentation, I've decided to focus on something slightly different, on on a slightly different question, which also is you know really central uh, to the book, uh, which is how we deal with this idea of cosmopolitan cosmopolitanism. Uh, in Egypt, and you know, particularly because uh, I'm talking at a Hellenic Studies Center, I'm hoping that this will be of interest to some of you because Greeks in Egypt uh, obviously uh, play a major part in this story. And um, so I'm going to start with this quote, which I found actually very near, near the beginning of writing this book. Uh, it's a quote from the 1910s and an Egyptian newspaper uh, in which someone who identifies himself as uh, a disgusted Englishman uh, writes in to complain that there was not a single music hall in Cairo where he could take his wives or daughters in good conscience. He protested that he'd never seen a show without, he quotes, some little indecency creeping in. Uh, and then he goes far further and asks that there is scarcely an artist who does not make some suggestion, veiled or unveiled, of this puerile indecency. Um, and for him, this uh, disgusted Englishman, uh, he knows exactly what's to blame. Uh, and this is the quote I've got for you here. He says that it's the cosmopolitanism of Cairo that is still retarding Egypt's progress. The manners of men in the audience, like the manners of the women on stage, are perfectly disgusting. 
Uh, and he goes on to complain also that uh, it's not just the Egyptian crowd, that this kind of cosmopolitanism has rubbed off on Englishmen too. And he admitted that they were also among the offenders. Um, so what I want to ask kind of in this talk is, what is he talking about the cosmopolitanism of Cairo? How should we, how should we read this? Uh, because as I'm sure many of you already know, when we talk about cosmopolitanism in Egypt, we usually look um, at these three men basically and, uh, and, and a few others in their general orbit, E.M. Forster, Lawrence Dahl and uh, Constantine Kavathi. Um, of course, it's a little mean to throw them all together because they all deal with cosmopolitanism, diversity, nationhood in extremely different ways, but they often are thrust together. They're often put into the scene of early 20th century Alexandria rather than Cairo, uh, into a scene where there's, where there's Greeks, there's Syrians, there's Europeans, all coming together in a kind of, if you believe you know, the very hazy-eyed nostalgia of it, in a very utopian kind of way, which it didn't matter where you came from, everyone was together in this one city that kind of belonged to everywhere and nowhere. I'm sure everyone kind of knows that story. In recent years, uh, particularly among Egyptians, uh, there's been a lot of critique of this story. I mean, in particular, uh, people have wondered, you know, who is it who actually gets to be cosmopolitan and who doesn't? Uh, Khaled Fahmi, uh, the uh, Egyptian historian who's now, now at Cambridge, uh, has written a lot on this. I've given a, a couple of uh, examples of his articles at the bottom, which are available, but he, he's written more. And, and basically his argument is Arabs, quote unquote, have always been left out uh, of this story. And they've been associated with what is considered the city's loss in 1950, uh, the 1950s, the free officers take power, cosmopolitanism, quote unquote, ends. Uh, and uh, as he says, uh, Khaled Fahmi says, this is a quote, when these Arabs are finally introduced into the city's narrative, it's either to highlight how much they did not really belong there or to stress how the responsibility of this city's final demise falls squarely on their shoulders uh, and theirs alone. Uh, and Khaled Fahmi is not alone in this critique. Many, many people have made it. Uh, in the years since then, uh, he published this article in, in, uh, in 2012, uh, people have pushed back still more against uh, his sort of strident position. So in, in 2018, uh, an Egyptian scholar called May Hawass uh, published uh, an article on how not to write on cosmopolitan Alexandria in which she separated people into, on the one hand, nostalgic cosmopolitanists, uh, you know, the kind of people who, uh, who saw the early 20th century as a sort of great utopia with no problems of power or colonialism or anything like that. Um, and the anti-nostalgic cosmopolitanists uh, in which she includes Khaled Fahmi, uh, who have sort of thrown the baby out the bathwater basically and, uh, and are not giving the, uh, the complexity of the early 20th century its due. Um, for people uh, in Mehoas's construction, these, for these anti-nostalgic cosmopolitanists, it's actually Durrell who is, who is the main uh, culprit, very colonialist, sort of does not consider the, uh, the Egyptian population at all. Um, Mehoas though went on to complain that, that neither of these camps are really interested in the complexities either of the historical period itself uh, or of Alexandria today. And she kind of ends this article with a, with a call to pay attention to the city as it is today, both in its failures and its potential. And in fact, in its um, cosmopolitan diversity of people from, from many different places now. And this was a very influential article. Uh, it in turn uh, engendered its own response. Uh, in fact, many of its own responses. One here, uh, Deborah Starr, uh, in which she essentially, uh, I mean, she responded in, in, in a lot of depth, which I, I'm not going to get into now, saying uh, as more than just these three, consider a broader scope. Um, Deborah Starr herself has had um, her own complex relationship with this term cosmopolitan. Uh, so in a recent book of hers on the um, Egyptian Jewish filmmaker, 
Togo's Mizrahi, she says she wants to throw the word cosmopolitan out of the window and in fact and really use the word Levantine uh, in a way uh, that she proposes can be more egalitarian whereas cosmopolitanism as you know, Fahmi was arguing is too exclusive and, and Levantine can be part of uh, a diverse and egalitarian community that still seeks to engage with the place where it is. I mean that is an extremely potted but but sort of necessary summary of uh, these debates that have been going on in the past decade, really, uh, about the cosmopolitanism, quote unquote, of Egypt, in particular the cosmopolitanism of Alexandria, was kind of has is in the background when you read that quote we had from the beginning of the man in the 1910s saying cosmopolitanism that has some um, really retarded its growth as he says and so i was thinking about how we can really put these two things together on the one hand that statement from the 1910s on the other hand this long history of debate about cosmopolitan alexandria and what i propose uh in short is to move away from Alexandria, look to Cairo, uh, and look um, to what lessons we can take from, from Cairo. And, and I've got this quote here from Sami Zubeda, actually quoted by Khaled Fahmi, in which he argues that the cultural mix and excitement of Cairo in the 1920s and 30s was cosmopolitan in a much more profound sense uh, than the celebrated European Levantine milieu of Alexandria. So let's kind of delve into Cairo and the kind of things he could mean by that. Um, and in order to do that, I think I sort of propose that we should turn to the nightlife scene, uh, the uh, scene that I've covered in, uh, in Midnight in Cairo. Uh, now, just for those who don't have a, uh, an extremely in-depth sort of background on, um, on Egypt's nightlife scene, uh, I'm going to lay out the sort of very basic history of it and its growth from the from the late 19th century until the 1920s so we can all really situate ourselves there so the beginning where i'm going to begin at least is is in the late 1860s uh, the early 1870s when egypt's khedive that's its uh, its ruler its hereditary ruler decided that he wanted to totally revamp the center of Cairo. Uh, you will see uh, on this map very well illustrated the, the Esbekeia Gardens there uh, circled in red, which he uh, redid. He brought in the man who, who did the Bois de Boulogne in Paris and reconstructed the gardens. And then you will see to the left, uh, to the west as well, of the gardens that he built this whole new grid system on a very European model, very different to what you see uh, to the right, which is more the, the old town of Cairo with these sort of much more based on sort of smaller dead end alleys and much windier. Uh, he sort of knocked all of that down, built a European city and crucially decided he wanted to build an opera house because every good European city in his mind had an opera house. So in 1869, this is what he did. Uh, it was very close, uh, just across from uh, the Espacare Gardens there. I mean, you could sort of, it's underneath, on the south of the Espacare Gardens, underneath that little red uh, circle. Uh, modeled on La Scala in, uh, in Milan. Largely speaking, this, this was a place for elite performances, uh, mostly in European languages. Famously, Verdi's Aida uh, debuted here. It was for traveling Europeans and for, for members of the Khedive's court who either would speak these European languages or would be given uh, a script they could follow along in Arabic or Ottoman Turkish. Uh, and it's this building of the Opera House and then subsequent uh, his building of another theater, which creates really this area as a sort of modern nightlife district, uh, which grew around it. But the, the entertainment that grew around it was not simply elite entertainment in European languages. Uh, it was for a, a really wide spectrum of people. So in the 1880s, here's this word Levantine again. Here by Levantine, I mean uh, 
uh, coming from the Levant, which is Syria, Lebanon, Israel, Palestine now, but back then was all just known as a sham. Um, a number of, of traveling theaters, uh, they set up their theater companies where the Khadid Ismail had built his opera house and his theaters uh, because that was becoming the nightlife district. And by doing so, they um, made it even more into the nightlife district. They were, however, performing plays in Arabic, uh, a mix, a very, uh, a big mix of different plays. So from kind of Shakespeare, uh, translated into Arabic and adapted to uh, plays by Racine and other French neoclassical uh, playwrights to, uh, as you'll see here, uh, stories from the, the kind of the Arabic tradition, whether that's the Arabian Nights or uh, other stories. I think this is a, um, or you, this picture on the left, uh, which is the picture of Abkhalil Kabeni's troupe from when they toured in America. That's a whole other long story. Uh, I think this is Antar and Shadad, which, which is a sort of old Arabian epic turned into a play. Um, so these troops came along and really bolstered the, the theatre scene, the Arabic speaking theatre scene, which then by the early 20th century was, was thriving and had both sort of local Egyptian uh, performers and these other people who are coming from, from the Levant. Alongside these theatres were also these music halls, uh, the kind of music halls uh, that our disgusted Englishmen hated so much. Uh, again, uh, they started to come in, in the 1880s and 90s and just really kept growing in popularity as the area grew further in popularity. Usually, as you'll see in these pictures, the main, the main performers tended to be women backed by uh, bands of uh, men playing instruments and the atmosphere was very raucous. You'll see on the left, a lot of bottles of champagne. Uh, women would be paid by how many bottles of champagne they could have opened, basically either for clientele or, or drinking it themselves. So it got very drunken in these nightclubs uh, and probably quite debauched and they, they eventually got a rather uh, unpleasant reputation. And so that's, that's kind of where we are in the late 19th century, very early 20th century. We have theaters, uh, we have music halls, and then in during the First World War, through a, a rather complex series of events, uh, which we don't really need to worry ourselves about so much. Essentially, uh, the British take official control of the country. They had been uh, in sort of unofficial control of the country until the First World War. Uh, lots of British soldiers come to Cairo, uh, cause an enormous amount of trouble in this nightlife district. Uh, the music halls are basically all closed down by the British military authorities. This in turn leads to the creation of this sort of very new genre of entertainment uh, known as the Franco-Arab Review, which can be sort of seen as a combination of, of, of the theater and the musicals, and put very simply. So there would be comic plays on stage. Uh, this man on, on the right is a sort of pioneer of the Franco-Arab Review. He's called Nagib al Rahani. Uh, his character is called Kish Kish Bey. He would do these sort of fun little farces and comic plays, uh, usually based around uh, the nightlife of Cairo and in fact, the very cosmopolitan mix of the city itself. We're gonna talk a little bit more about how these plays uh, dealt with the different communities living in Cairo now, but it's enough uh, later, sorry, but now it's just enough to say uh, that they did and featured, uh, as you'll see in this picture on the left, dancing troops of, so there will be song and dance numbers alongside the plays. Uh, that's how the nightlife is shaping up up until 1919. And don't worry, we're getting to the 1920s soon. But again, just a little bit of uh, housekeeping to make sure everyone's on the same page. Um, so in 1919, a revolution came. Very brief history of this uh, is that, as I said before, the British were in control of Egypt uh, throughout the First World War. Uh, they um, had, uh, and they had really exerted 
like quite harsh control on Egypt. They had requisitioned a lot of uh, materials, a lot of food, and had forced people into service. When the war's over, Egypt expects to be given its independence, particularly given as the Paris Peace Conference is promising national self-determination to smaller nations and all of this. Uh, but Egypt, uh, when they petition the British government to send a delegation to the Paris Peace Conference, is rejected. Uh, and in fact, they soon discover that the self-determination for smaller nations does not include them. Uh, people take to the streets. There's pictures of uh, two protests from 1919 here uh, to uh, call for independence, essentially, both in the city and the countryside. The British respond very violently, but it, but it doesn't really do anything. People keep coming out, people keep protesting, and eventually, 1922, uh, Britain grants Egypt a kind of uh, qualified independence. It has uh, There's various strings attached become important later on, uh, but it's victory for the protests really. And that's where we are uh, at the beginning of Cairo's Roaring Twenties and at the beginning of this period where I'm going to ask what cosmopolitan looks, cosmopolitanism looks like for Egypt. So we're going to cast aside Alexandria and we're going to come to Cairo, not just to Cairo, but to its nightlife district where you can see on this map there are theatres, there are cinemas, there are music halls, all sort of rubbing shoulders with each other in this, this kind of very vibrant nightlife in a newly independent country, which has been given a lot of its, you know, which has been given its independence and is now asking, what does it mean for Egypt, this new country, to be independent? How should we construct our national identity? How are we going to deal with the various different nationalities who, um, who live here? Because of course, before this time, the question of what is an Egyptian has largely gone unanswered, but now it's a question that's at the forefront of everyone's minds. What is this new nation state? What is an Egyptian? Does it include, for example, the Greeks who are, who are in the country or, or does it not? And on the, on the nightlife stages, I will come back to that. Um, these questions are, are really being debated. So uh, by its very nature, the entertainment industry in Egypt is an extremely cosmopolitan place, by which I mean uh, it's a place made up of lots of different nationalities. Um, whether or not that's a good definition for cosmopolitanism, we will come to at the end, uh, but I think it's a, a largely accepted one. And so you'll see here, and this is a very common sight to see, uh, this is a program for a film, The Merry Widow, in English, French, Greek, and Arabic. Uh, that's the main uh, languages of uh, the nightlife in Egypt. Uh, in fact, a lot of cinema, a lot of films, would be given intertitles in the in the silent movie era, intertitles in these four different languages so everyone could understand them. Um, and since we are in the Stavros Niarchos Center, I will go, I will talk a little bit just about a few of um, the Greek personalities who were part of this cosmopolitan nightlife district. So to start with, uh, there are bar owners, impresarios, and waiters. And in, in fact, the Greek waiter in Egypt is a, is a real type that goes throughout the 20th century and is, is, is known, features in plays and novels. And a lot of the bars and cafes uh, in this area were um, staffed by Greek waiters and owned uh, by Greeks. One particularly fun example uh, that I've given to you here is um, this music hall that was owned by, um, that was fronted by this woman, Tauhida, who is in the picture. And I will go back. Uh, it is this, the Thousand and One Nights music hall uh, there to the, uh, to the right of the Esbukea Gardens. Now, the story of this is, it was started in the 1880s, probably 1890s, uh, by uh, a Greek called Manoli Ioannidis, who, featured Tauhida as one of his main stars and in fact married 
Tauhida. So, uh, so they were a husband and wife pair. He died uh, long before her and she took over the music hall was uh, unlike in fact, many women of the era who a large number of them fronted music halls, but very few of them actually owned them. Uh, but Diyama Subni is, is another example of that. Uh, and we can talk about that more in the q and if people would like to. Um, but she, by dint of marrying Manoli uh, and then him dying, managed to take over this music hall and run it. Um, so it's a, it's a kind of, again, it's a real example here of an Arabic speaking uh, Egyptian entertainer really being part of this cosmopolitan scene, not being excluded. Um, but it's not only as um, you know owners that uh, and uh, and waiters the Greeks feature. Uh, there are a lot of extremely prominent uh, Greek performers on the nightclub nightclub stages, dancers, uh, singers, and such. I have uh, here on on the right is one uh, uh, dancer called Calliope, who I believe to be uh, the same dancer uh, as appears in the memoirs of this man on the left. Uh, Yusuf Wahbi. Uh, now, Yusuf Wahbi was one of the great theatre um, owners, impresarios uh, of the 1920s. He was um, he set up in 1923 the Ramses Theatre uh, Theatre Troupe and bought the Ramses Theatre and was really intending to move uh, Egyptian theatre into the modern age, as he put it. In his memoirs, he leaves behind some very salacious stories of the nightlife in Cairo before he set up this theatre, so in the late 1910s and the early 1920s. And one story which he mentions is his first love, uh, a dancer by the name of Calliope, uh, who is Greek uh, and is married to a Greek man, but Yusuf Wahbi professes his love for Calliope, steals her from uh, her husband, downtown and then decides he doesn't want to live with her anymore and goes to Milan to try and become a an actor in Milan leaving her uh, alone and uh, in rather dire straits because in fact he has split her up from her husband this is uh, not to do with a uh, cosmopolitanism but just a rather sad footnote to the story he has split her up from her husband Calliope's mother then contracts cancer and she doesn't have any money to pay for the uh, surgery. So she has to tail between her legs, go back to the husband who promises that she will pay for her mother's uh, cancer treatment. And there's a series of, of letters which Yusuf Wahbi reproduces in his memoirs, uh, which may or may not be true. He was quite an egomaniacal guy uh, of her saying how sorry she is that she believe him, but this is the only thing that she can do, et cetera, et cetera. Um, all to say that various different performers of, of Egypt's nightlife, uh, Greeks feature very prominently and uh, perhaps most prominently uh, is this woman, uh, Kitty or Katie uh, Vutsaki, who is sometimes called Futsati in Arabic, although that's just a sort of corruption of her name. Uh, and she has, she in fact sort of comes a little bit later on in this story, more in the 40s and 50s, but is, is, is definitely the biggest sort of Greek star of Egypt's nightlife. I would be very interested to talk to anyone who might know anything about her because in fact, her later life is really the subject of a lot of scandal uh, in which it's claimed that she was kicked out of Egypt for spying for Israel. Uh, most people sort of doubt that that's true. That's just a myth that's sort of built around her. And it is said, in fact, that she still lives in Athens today and is still uh, and uh, is still going, could be called on to uh, confirm or deny any of these stories. But what I'm going to try and do now is just play a little bit of her dancing. I'm hoping that the internet is going to be strong enough uh, to sort of cope with it. I won't play the whole thing. But I'm just going to play a, a section when she comes on to dance, just to sort of uh, give people an idea of, uh, of what kind of thing we'd be likely to see. <laughs> 
I'll, I'll leave it. I'll leave it there so we don't go on too long. Uh, but that's just a, a brief bit uh, for the uh, for the Hellenic studies people among you, just to just to give a few references to Greeks who made up this uh, this industry. I uh, am working on my Greek, currently living uh, in Athens, although I'm not there right now. But certainly, it's it's nowhere near good enough to do uh, any research into this. So so you'll have noticed that. Uh, in fact, most of the Greeks who feature in this uh, do so because of their relationship to other Arabic performers, Tawhida and uh, Yusuf Wakbi. But I think there must be, uh, you know, out there a big store of, of memoirs or at least letters and, and papers of the myriad other Greek performers who are on stage. I mean, I just see references to them in the Arabic, uh, but their stories must be accessible. So um, that's just a sort of impetus to anyone who feels like uh, really getting stuck into Greek archives uh, about uh, saying that there must be a lot of really great stories out there, not least uh, Kitty or Katie Futsaki, who is apparently still alive in Athens. Um, but if I can manage to go to the next page, there we go. Um, as well as um, Greeks, uh, the scene in Cairo really included uh, a huge number of different people uh, and a huge number of different nationalities of languages, uh, of backgrounds and of religions. Uh, I mean, everything that cosmopolitan Alexandria is said to be, we find it in the nightlife stages of cosmopolitan Cairo. Uh, so on, I'll go through some of these pictures and explain what we are seeing. Uh, on the right, the top right, that is a troupe of Hungarian dancers who uh, performed in uh, one of the greatest cabarets of Cairo in, in the 1930s in, in Badia Masabni's cabaret. Uh, on the bottom right are George Duncan and Billy Brooks, two really fascinating uh, men actually, whose stories are preserved in a long series of letters uh, to the Chicago Defender uh, they left uh, America in uh, in the late 19th century. Uh, they're both from the American South, and they went on a tour with um, a sort of Uncle Tom's Cabin troupe around Europe. And then instead of going back to America when the tour was over, they decided to cash in their return tickets, travel around, and eventually in the 1910s, they ended up in Cairo, trying to push the jazz scene, the extremely nascent jazz scene in, in the city. Uh, though by the early 1920s, a few others had joined them and they weren't even the biggest jazz performers in the, in the, uh, in the country. There's another man called Billy Farrell who they're always complaining about is more successful than them. Uh, but for 10 years and even a little more, uh, there were real mainstays of the nightlife scene and uh, Billy Brooks actually died in Cairo and uh, we don't know what happened to George Duncan. Uh, then uh, to their left is Rosal Youssef, uh, a great actress who was uh, born in, um, in Tripoli in Lebanon. So this scene not only included uh, Arabic speaking Egyptians, uh, but also included many Arabic speaking people from uh, from the Levant, as we um, as we already saw, theatre, uh, the theatre troops uh, had long come from the Levant, and that was a, a tradition that did not stop uh, in the 1920s. So Rosa Yusuf herself, uh, again, I mean, every single person has these fascinating backstories, and Rosa Yusuf, uh, who left her story in uh, in a memoir that she wrote in the 1950s, uh, actually turns up in Alexandria uh, as, a, as a young girl, sort of in her very early teens in the 1910s, manages to get the money to come to Cairo uh, by train. She's kicked off the train and turns up in basically Esbekeia because the train station is very close and falls into the nightlife scene. And that's how she sort of makes her career. She becomes one of the most successful actresses uh, and then eventually starts her own entertainment magazine called Rosal Youssef after herself, which becomes then Egypt, one of Egypt's most prominent uh, entertainment and politics magazines. 
uh, to her left is a is a troop of just Armenian. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have the the caption seems to be cut off, but it's just an Armenian dramatic circle. Uh, on the left of them is an extremely interesting woman about whom I have been able to find very little. Uh, her name is Idel Habashea, which must be a stage name. Um, Habashea basically just means, you know, from the sub-Saharan Africa, really the region of Ethiopia and, and Sudan. Uh, and Ida, I'm, I'm guessing named after Verdi's opera, Ida, she starts off as a, in the 1920s, as a promising young uh, comic actress mostly and singer and a few articles details of her background and then almost as quickly as she appears uh, she disappears um, but all to say what I'm trying to do is is just give a little sense of uh, the real diversity of different people who were involved in this nightlife scene in Cairo and um, the and I'm arguing that fewer people really are left out of this scene uh, as they are left out of what we conceive to be cosmopolitan Alexandria. So I'm I'm sort of siding a little bit with Khaled Fahmi here, who who says that you know quote unquote Arabs are so often left out of the um, cosmopolitan scene of Alexandria. Here we come to the nightlife scene, and we see that Arabs are very much not left out. Uh, a lot of the performances are done in Arabic. The Franco-Arab Review uh, is a is a mixture of Arabic and French, and all different kinds of audience would, would audiences would have clearly gone to see it. Uh, but you'd get most out of it if you spoke both Arabic and French. Uh, and uh, you know, even people from like I don't have a share from probably Sudan or perhaps Ethiopia uh, have a part to play in this scene and are kind of really trying to negotiate in this new Egypt uh, what part everyone is, is, is going to get to play uh, in the nation because at the same time as they're trying to form a nightlife scene they're also trying to form uh, national identity um, and this I suppose is um, something like the cosmopolitanism that uh, the disgusted Englishman uh, who we met at the beginning uh, was talking about. People coming from uh, from different places, people not necessarily uh, adhering to the sort of rather buttoned up English rules of decorum, uh, but people coming together. And that's sort of the hopeful view of what a cosmopolitanism could be. And in my sort of more hopeful and brighter periods, I like to think that this nightlife scene can be a different model uh, to previous ones that we've had for cosmopolitanism in particularly an Egyptian context, one that is more inclusive, one that's perhaps more optimistic. That is how I like to see it in my brighter periods, but I must admit that that's not necessarily how it always played out. Uh, was this place really a, a cosmopolitan utopia, one has to ask, and the answer is not always uh, yes. As with uh, any scene, any uh, kind of society in which people from various different backgrounds are interacting, questions of power frequently arrive, arise, uh, and you know, often they cut many different ways. So this is a quote from a, a play, from a song, from a play by Nagiba Raheni, who you will remember perhaps from the beginning. We had him here, this is him. This is what one of his plays would have looked like. As I said, they were frequently interspersed with song. And this is one song about a Greek man called Haralambo, uh, who has been swindling the main uh, actor. So Haralambo Har saw that my pocket was full. He immediately stood still, mesmerized. His eyes were on my farmland. He told me, let's play some poker. Uh, he made me drink Johnny Walker. I played, got drunk and lost until I fell into the abyss. Uh, and in these plays, uh, like the Franco-Arab Review, uh, 
characters like this, uh, European, very often uh, Greek characters who kind of attempt to swindle the honest Egyptian peasant, which is sort of what uh, this Nagiba Rohani's character is an idealized version of, out of money, usually by seducing them into gambling, drinking, nightclubs, all of the things that were in full abundance in the Esbakea district and the nightlife district, they frequently appear. Uh, and as um, Ziad Fahmi uh, in his book, Ordinary Egyptians, where this quote comes from, also notes, Haralambo was a very common um, name for Greek characters in part because Hara in Arabic means shit. Uh, so it's not a very nice name uh, to give to a Greek, but people did frequently use it. And as the 1920s and 1930s continued, uh, and the fact that uh, Egyptian independence, which had been promised in, in 1922, started to look less uh, and less uh, actual. I mean, they were officially independent, but it seemed like lots of different people had control over them. Uh, growing resentment to sort of European communities rose uh, and in particular, uh, amongst many people, European nightlife. And this is a, um, uh, a good illustration of that. So there was a, a long running complaint uh, that the Egyptian government actually financed foreign troops, uh, foreign language troops to come in the winter and put on performances. So these are sort of slightly separate from the nightlife that we've actually been talking about, more closely related to the opera house of the Khedive. These were foreign troops, these were not really based in Egypt at all. There were often sort of troops like the Comédie Française who would come in, put on performances and, uh, and then leave again. The Egyptian government always justified this expense by saying it was important for tourism, that tourists should be able to see these big troops. Uh, but people frequently resented it, uh, particularly in fact as uh, Egyptian troops themselves did not get the same funding. Uh, but also as this cartoon very much sort of highlights, uh, there was a growing sense in the 1930s, particularly after the after the depression, uh, that Egyptians, sort of ordinary Egyptians and, and Egyptians who live in the countryside were having an extremely hard time, were starving, and the uh, Egyptian government was just lavishing money on Europeans and on European theater troops, which is what they're doing here. Uh, and obviously the sort of morality of uh, dressing the European theater troops uh, as a sort of scantily clad woman uh, is deliberate. So this all really comes to a head in, in the 1950s uh, with uh, the Cairo fire and subsequent events. Uh, and the Cairo fire cannot be really separated from the history of this cosmopolitan nightlife uh, in particular, because in fact, the fire was started in a nightclub. It was the nightclub run by Badia Masobni, who I've mentioned before. I'll give a, a very brief uh, kind of backstory as to who she is, because she, again, like so many people on this scene, really encapsulates uh, the cosmopolitanism, or at least the, the diversity of, um, of Egypt's nightlife. She was born in Damascus, uh, she then had to leave at a young age. She had quite a tragic life story, which again, like so many of the women, uh, she recorded herself in her own memoirs. Um, she has to leave Damascus at a young age because she is raped. Uh, probably she's only about 10 or 11. Uh, and, she, um, and she is very disheartened to see that, in fact, she is then blamed for it, really. She goes into church. Uh, as she always does, and the family is very much sort of excluded from their local church because uh, because this rape has happened. So they move on first to Lebanon, then they actually end up moving on to South America. As you'll see, she, you know, she really travels the world. But then she comes to Cairo, where she comes, like so many, like Rosal Youssef, to Esbakea, uh, where she sees this thriving nightlife scene tries to make something, you know, she sees people up on stage dressed in fancy clothes and as, as the way she describes it, full of the confidence that she kind of doesn't have, the ability to tell people that they can't do things, which she lacked. Um, and she throws herself into the scene. Uh, 
joins a theater troupe, goes back to Beirut for a while where she runs a cabaret, then comes to Cairo where in the 1920s, she sets up her own cabaret like herself. Uh, it is the product of uh, the world. She brings in artists from everywhere. She brings in uh, Rosita Montenegro from Spain, who later on went, to, went on to have some success in the movies. She brings in a lot of people from, uh, from the Levant. She tours Europe almost all the time, recruiting people for her nightclub, and it becomes a, a massive success. One of the, the biggest successes of, of Cairo's nightlife. Um, during the Second World War, it continues as a success. And now we come to the time of the Cairo fire, the very beginning of 1952. Um, and nationalist questions are once again rearing their head uh, very strongly uh, because Britain is refusing to leave uh, the Suez Canal Zone. So when he just got independence in 22, uh, Britain maintains control of the Suez Canal Zone after the Second World War, when again, Egypt has been subject to foreign soldiers and, and a lot of privations. Uh, people start to get fed up with the British in the Canal Zone and essentially guerrilla war erupts. Uh, a few days before the Cairo fire, the British walk into a police station and kill a lot of Egyptian police. Huge protests erupt in Cairo. Uh, during these protests, uh, some people see a police officer on the terrace of Badia Masabni's opera house, uh, sorry, an opera casino, not opera house, although it's called the opera casino because it's near the opera house, um, drinking with a dancer. They ask him, you know, how could you be doing this in this time of uh, national crisis? Uh, he responds sort of derisively to them. They end up burning down the casino the, and then end up burning down a huge swathe of Esbekeia and the nightlife district, uh, including this is the Shepherd's Hotel, uh, which is on, um, you know, which takes up this picture, but really things that are burnt down include any symbols of sort of foreign power, uh, which is so Barclays Bank, uh, the turf clubs, the British officers club, foreign department stores and a lot of nightclubs and bars. And the Guardian newspaper at the time said that almost every bar and nightclub was burnt down. Um, so to sort of wrap up uh, and ask, what does it mean then to, uh, to shift our view of, uh, of cosmopolitanism to the, uh, to the nightlife scene? I mean, I hope I've showed, I could show in, in more detail if necessary, uh, that in many ways, this nightclub scene w was a better example of cosmopolitanism than the, uh, the literary world of Durrell. Certainly, Cavafy could be argued and, and Ian Forster, but this sort of very Europeanized, quite exclusive view of cosmopolitanism that people see in, in literary Alexandria, in Cairo, on the other hand, there's a very organic, a very, a much more diverse, broader example of a cosmopolitan scene than there was in Alexandria. But in every cosmopolitan scene, uh, as every cosmopolitan world, there are these two big tensions. Um, the first is that uh, cosmopolitanism is the enemy of of nationalism, I, mean, I think, sort of almost by definition. Uh, I mean, a scene that is cosmopolitan and cosmopolitan does not worry about nationality, is not concerned with nationality. In fact, is is very is against nationality. And in the time of the 1950s, uh, when a post-colonial nationalism is rising, uh, obviously, then it becomes a target. Uh, also, there is a worrying fear uh, that despite the increased sort of inclusivity of this nightclub scene in Cairo when compared to Alexandria, it's still protected by privilege. It's still protected by ownership, by in many ways a, a colonial government. And it's somewhat divorced from the reality that many Egyptians at the time are, are going through, which is a reality of, of privation and of, 
uh, and of attack. Uh, so I don't want to completely utopianize this cosmopolitan scene. But what I sort of am trying to do with this uh, with this lecture is say that okay, there are other ways to think about. Uh, diversity and cosmopolitanism in Egypt, which can include many more people, which can actually put some of these issues much more to the forefront, these issues of uh, nationalism, because at the same time as this extremely diverse theater scene is emerging, uh, people are using plays to engage with ideas of nationalism, sometimes uh, to critique uh, cosmopolitanism, sometimes to support it, uh, but always engaging with it in a way perhaps that some of the more traditional histories of uh, Alexandria have ignored. Uh, so I'm hoping there'll be some sort of questions and comments because this is sort of something that I'm really still trying to work through. And I'm also trying to start thinking uh, past this book about the period of the 1950s and the 60s when decolonization really happens and when this period of uh, kind of this golden age of the 1920s is seen to all fall apart. And I'm, I'm trying to look again at, at what the nightclub scene can tell us about that period and how it can maybe uh, add some complexities to the rather non-complex story that we're normally told about Egypt, with, which is that after the Free Officers Revolution, it becomes an extremely monocultural place uh, I'm looking at ways that maybe we could try and um, look beyond that. So I'd be very happy to, you know, hear any comments or critiques that you guys have. Likewise, uh, I'd be very happy to talk more about women's roles uh, in all of this. So I've uh, I've got here a picture of uh, the, the Mitri troupe uh, of dancers. You'll notice they're all women. You will also notice that most of the cosmopolitan figures I've talked about, although not all, uh, have been women. Uh, and I think that's not just a coincidence of the kind of sources that I'm using. Of course, this book that I've written has tried to tell the story through women's perspectives, but the diversity of um, different performers is much more obvious when you look at female performances performers than when you look at male performers. And there are some reasons I can speculate as to why that would be, not all of them good. Uh, but I'm very happy to also discuss that too. Uh, so I'm hoping there'll be some questions and uh, I'm gonna stop sharing the PowerPoint and say, thank you very much. Thank you, this was fantastic. Thank you so much. I invite the audience to uh, uh, join us with questions using the raise hand option or the uh, chat function. I will get us started and I'm particularly interested in women's history. Uh, and I wanted to ask if we have any more information about the backgrounds of the performers, if they were from particular classes, um, if also we can see the nightclub scene and the performance, depending on how secular society was, particularly in the 20s, mm -hmm. as a place where gender identities are collapsing. Uh, so we see transgress, collapsing the, again, the, the polarity of masculine and feminine uh, from a different performance. Um, more questions coming up, but if we can, we can start with those. Uh, yeah, I mean, those are both, uh, are both great questions. As to the, so the first one, the background of the performers. Uh, we are in some ways limited by what records survive. Uh, and a lot of records, in fact, do survive, and a lot of stories do survive, uh, particularly of the Arabic-speaking performers of this scene. So I'll, I'll go through that before I go through the, the lack. Uh, so almost every major, or a large number of major singers, dancers, uh, and actresses left behind memoirs. So I mean, Rosal Youssef, I mentioned, did. Badia Masabni, who was a, a cabaret owner, did. Various other others did too. So Munir al Mate, who was a great singer, Fatih Rushdi, the list goes on. Uh, and all of them actually had extremely similar lives. Uh, almost none of them were really significantly formally educated. Uh, they almost all lost their, their father when they were young. Uh, 
and were sort of thrown into this nightclub scene. Uh, and in many ways, they managed to use it to gain that extreme personal independence, wealth, uh, you know, ability to tell their stories, which so many women at the time didn't have. So they, there's some, we have some really amazing stories told by women which survive in a period, the early 20th century, when we're so often told women's stories don't really survive that well, and you can only find them by looking very hard. In fact, you'll find in the entertainment scene, a huge number of women's stories survive. Uh, and and they tell fascinating. There's similar a lot of similarities between them, which is which is very interesting. But you know, they each tell their own kind of fascinating rise. Uh, so that's the the good stuff that we have. But there are also there's a lot of lack in the stories. So we only really have the memoirs, of course, of the people who became famous. Uh, and the people who become famous are a small proportion of everyone who's working in Cairo's entertainment industry. So you go through the uh, uh, popular press at the time, which, which actually is obsessed with women's lives. Uh, so so that's, that's another lens into women's lives, not always the best one. Uh, and you will see so many names that just appear a few times and, and you'll never know. So non-successful people don't really, their stories don't survive that well, nor do um, people who don't quite fit the right narrative and this is important for the talk that we've uh, you know that i've just given most of these memoirs are written in the 1950s and 60s in arabic in egypt uh, others may exist but i've not really been able to find them so a lot of people who really make up the diversity of the scene don't get their stories told either because uh you know there, in Hungary, for instance, no one's interested in the story of a nightclub singer in Cairo, where a lot of dancers came from Hungary, or because in Cairo in the 1950s and 60s, people are much more interested in having Arabic speaking national heroes. So they're not as interested in publishing the stories of uh, a Hungarian dancer. So, I mean, in both of those, their, their stories kind of get left out. And uh, I'm sure in some ways, those stories can be found uh, in the case of, of Hungarians. Uh, it may well be that, that someone has left a memoir or that they're in the National Archives, there's, uh, there's some good memoir, there's some good letters or something, but I don't have access to them. I only have access to Arabic and French and English and so on. Um, but as I sort of talk about much more in the book, it's a really, this period, is overlooked a little in the history of women's life writing. And there's so much of it, so much was done both at the time and afterwards, but somehow uh, it's not literary maybe, right? It's, sort of, it's been left out, particularly in the, in the history of Egyptian life writing, it's been left out and we looked at more. Uh, and then to go to the second question, uh, unless you have any follow-ups to that. Well, no, I mean, this is great. Uh, they, well, I, there are, but I, I wait a lot. I'll, I'll also give the audience uh, opportunity to, to ask you questions. But yes, please go ahead. I'm just going to share my screen again, uh, because, I mean, yes, it, it is the short answer. There's a lot of uh, mixing up, you know, gender fluidity and mixing up of genders going on on the on the nightclub stages of Cairo. The, and one interpretation of it is, something I didn't really talk about in the, uh, in the paper is that this is a real flowering period for Egyptian feminism more generally speaking. Uh, so after the 1919 revolution, there's a, a quite elite perhaps, but nonetheless a very powerful feminist movement uh, that focuses on women's education, kind of some political rights. It's not until the 50s that women get the right to vote in Egypt, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, and criminalizing marriage under the age of 14 or 16, I can't remember, this kind of thing. Uh, a mainstream feminist movement is going on. 
Uh, but at the same time, uh, women are just becoming so much more prominent in pub in public space in Cairo, and, and that's everywhere. In the magazines, people talk about it, uh, and this. So this little uh, cartoon I've got is from a magazine in the 1920s, uh, in which they're saying, "Oh, women seem to be taking the place of men in everything," uh, and they make this little joke uh, because uh, in Islam. Uh, a man can marry four wives, but a woman can't take four husbands. So the joke is here that in the future, women will be marrying four husbands. So that's the woman at the front with her four husbands behind her. Um, and on the nightclub stages, this idea of the fluidity of gender, perhaps related uh, to the idea that women are appearing in male spaces much more, perhaps not, is it's really everywhere. And, People send in actresses, particularly, although also the general public will dress up in a, in a male costume and send it into newspapers. And there's uh, really tens of, of, of pictures like this just in one newspaper. You'll see an actress will dress up as a, as a man uh, in male clothes and sort of make a little joke about it, as well as actresses taking male roles on stage, which they can, which they're doing much more in this period. Uh, partly inspired by Sarah Bernhardt, but partly um, uh, partly not, and partly just independently. Uh, and so with this idea of gender and women's space in the public sphere being debated across the culture, I mean, you see it a lot in the nightclub scene, um, as well as a longer tradition of sort of gender fluid performance, which which did exist in Egypt, and which kind of interacts with that a little bit. I mean, it's a lot. That's a much longer answer to give, but the short answer is there's a long way going on. That's fantastic. And I, I, in my mind, I also was thinking when you started talking about the 40s and 50s of Josephine Baker and how we have great performers in the European context, uh, French American, and activists as well emerging uh, and becoming known from the performance, but significant political uh, figures. Uh, I'll stop here. There are two questions so far. Uh, I'll read out loud the first one from Alex Jovanovic. Thank you for the thought-provoking talk. I was wondering if we see any examples of the singers and actresses trying to find explanations for their professions in Egyptian folklore and traditions, or do they simply disregard these as something regressive as they frame themselves solely as Sarah Bernhardt's of the East who emulate Western models, models which were oftentimes forcefully introduced as the only progressive mode of cosmopolitan social being? Yeah, that's a, I mean, yeah, that's a great question. And they're, they are constantly in uh, negotiation with older traditions. And in this period, it, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult question often to answer. And uh, even Egyptians uh, will sometimes give uh, this sort of quite simple answer that performance like theater and like cabarets has just come from, from Europe, has just been imported from Europe, and that's the model that they're following. Uh, but if you look uh, much uh, you know, further back into it, uh, you will see that, that there's, there's various different performance traditions being drawn on. Uh, so uh, there's a long performance of shadow play, a long shadow play tradition in Egypt, as well as a long tradition of kind of these comic skits which clearly Nagiba Rohani and his Franca Arab Review uh, are picking up on, as well as uh, a long tradition of singing and dancing, which goes back you know, all the way to the, you know, the, the first days of Islam and, and before. Um, what's, what I haven't really seen, although I wouldn't say it doesn't necessarily exist, is people very explicitly um, engaging with, with that kind of question until we get to the 40s and 50s. Uh, and then and then they really do. But in the 1920s and 30s, much less so. What you generally tend to see is uh, a more, what I see as organic process, largely partly dictated by audiences. I mean, so one key example of this uh, is the role of singing in theatre. Uh, and audiences, it's clear in Egypt, 
will not go and see a play if it doesn't have singing in it. They, uh, they, they partly go in order to hear the songs and then the songs get released as records later and become hits on their own. And, and they're sort of attempts to put on plays without singing, but everyone seems to hate them. Uh, but <laughs> the critics in the newspapers uh, don't like this fact uh, and they're always looking to European drama and saying, look, drama is not supposed to have singing in it. Look at Shakespeare, although I mean, Arguably, there are songs in Shakespeare, but that's not the way they see it in the early, early 20th century. Like, look at all this European drama. It doesn't have singing in it. Singing is kind of a uh, uh, backwards uh, form. It's not refined. It's not high theatre. Um, but nevertheless, I mean, people keep doing it. Uh, so what you what you end up getting is uh, sort of theatre practitioners and and also you know people. It's very hard to separate between singers, dancers, and theatre practitioners at the time because they're all appearing in the same stages, really, in the same shows, doing the same kinds of things. But you get these people who are making work, uh, doing performances, which seems clearly influenced by much older performance traditions, and then getting critiqued by people in the press for saying, this is not really what theatre should be, this is not really refined. Uh, and unspoken in that is what you're doing is not kind of European enough. Um, but I, so that's what I see happening. But as I say, I, I, I haven't really seen people explicitly talk in the way that they do, particularly in the 1950s, about, oh, this is a revival of a time on an Egyptian folk tradition. And uh, and this is why I am doing it, and I'm doing it because it's different from European folk tradition. They don't, they don't haven't seen that many self justifications like that. It just seems to kind of happen. Um, yeah. Thank They're you not. so much. Uh, more comments uh, and questions coming in. Uh, the next one is from Nas Varda. Thank you for the very interesting talk. I'm looking forward to reading the book. You have talked about the nightlife being an elite entertainment. I was wondering if you can talk about, uh, if you can talk more about the audience consumer of this type of entertainment. Do you have any information about who the audience were, how the experience of participating in this nightlife was like? Can we talk about a cosmopolitan audience too? Mm, yeah, great. That's a uh, to the question. Always, of course, it's very hard to be sure about any of this kind of thing. And, you know, you would love to have uh, a full democratic get demographic answer to who was in the audience, and we don't quite have that. Uh, but from the accounts that we have, I uh, we can definitely say that there's a very cosmopolitan audience. And although, as I said, there's a view, this is kind of only entertainment for the elite, uh, I think the reality is that that is, is not the case at all. Uh, you'll see people, you know, accounts of people who go and they will notice that, you know, although the audience might be separated somewhat, so that's sort of the middle class Europeans and perhaps the sort of the Levantines who sit at the front and then others, uh, you know, the more ordinary Egyptian spectators who sit at the back. Uh, and there's clearly some kind of division uh, between exactly which uh, theatre you would go to. So, um, so if you're going to the Opera House, for instance, you're a member of the elite. Um, and if you're going to a one of the musicals uh, that we saw at the very beginning, uh, you're almost, you're, you're definitely Arabic speaking unless you're sort of a tourist who's gone in the air to see what the locals are doing. Uh, and you're probably um, from a sort of ordinary Egyptian, we would say, background. Um, and then there's everything in between. I think the Franco-Arab Review particularly clearly had a very diverse audience uh, and catered obviously to a diverse audience by putting bits in Arabic, bits in French uh, and all the rest of it. Uh, so yeah, it's, I would love to see exactly who was going, but I think you can, you can really do get a sense that there's, a, that there's lots of different people going. And I think the characterization that this was only for the elite and Europeans, which, which some people have, is, is just not true. I wanted a quick question, uh, connecting it a little bit to the audience. Uh, and after the the uh, fire that took place in Cairo, I suspect that some of the structure, opera house or other nightclubs 
uh, were also damaged. Were there uh, more built and did that change as well? Who got the access to uh, these nightclubs? Yeah, the Opera House actually survived and then burned, actually burned down separately in, 19, in the 1970s. But you know, just the kind of Opera Houses tend to burn down kind of thing. I don't think there's any, uh, it wasn't burnt down on purpose. Um, the things do start to get rebuilt, uh, and, but really by the 1950s, things are also starting to change a lot more because the film industry is becoming so big. And so a lot of places become cinemas. Um, and, and that obviously completely changes uh, how people interact with the uh, stuff. I mean, still today you have, there are cabarets there uh, and theatres uh, which function many fewer than there were back then. And, and there's also other sort of cabaret districts. Uh, my sense, like I say, I'm looking more into this now, is that, so that really film begins to take over much more. And that's really what changes everything. And then we have a, another question from Dimitris Kralis, uh, more coming as well. There is a st stereotypical association of performing artists and loose morals. Think Theodora for the Byzantine case. The angry British commentator seems to be perhaps indirectly alluding to that. But any discussion of loose morality also raises the question of prostitution with a corollary of exploitation and exposure that ran in parallel to the opportunities that the spectacle industry offers. Do we have these dimensions in the world you study? And could you speak to this possibly parallel context of liberation exploitation? Hmm. Finally, are there ethnic dimensions to such contrasts that would play to questions of nationalism and resistance to exploitation? Uh, great, uh, I've got a lot to say about that. Firstly, uh... There's definitely uh, this connection between uh, performing artists and prostitution and loose morals. Uh, and people are very aware of it at the time, obviously. So actresses are very keen uh, often to tell people, to in insist on people that they are not prostitutes. So clearly that is a, um, a charge that is thrown against them. Uh, in nightclubs, Clearly, people would, would have been, it's, I mean, it seems clear from the evidence that many people would have seen nightclub dancers and singers as sexually available to them. And there's some pretty strong suggestion uh, that a lot of prostitution happened in nightclubs, as well as, which I didn't mention, this area, it consisted of theatres, cabarets, uh, nightclubs, all the rest of it, and the red light district of Cairo, which uh, in the 1880s, sort of the British basically came in and saw there you know, was a sort of system of prostitution, but they really enforced a, a strict red light district and they gave uh, permissions and kind of permits to prostitutes to work in there. And, and, and it was all licensed. So spatially speaking, uh, the area was also very associated with prostitution because it was also the red light district. Uh, and yes, I think it's extremely clear that there is this real parallel world as well as the uh, opportunities for liberation that, that were given to some women and independence. Uh, exploitation is never far away, even from the very successful ones, but definitely uh, from the unsuccessful ones. And uh, um, so one of the reasons, as I said before, I mean, I think it's striking that there's, there's often a, uh, a much broader uh, diversity of backgrounds amongst women than there are amongst men uh, is partly connected to this exploitation. And some uh, people uh, being really brought in to exploit. I mean, I think that's, there is at the same time as this is sort of happening in the early, 20th century, this kind of white slave trade panic, uh, which is also informed by a lot of exploitation that's going on. So chorus girls, quote unquote, are imported uh, by people uh, sometimes explicitly to uh, exploit and you know, often underneath the official kind of visas that are given to dancers who will come to Egypt and perform for a summer, people are led to believe that they're being brought to Cairo as dancers, but in fact, they're being brought as prostitutes. Uh, 
So that happens to a lot of European women. And I mean, I think that's one of the reasons uh, why you see, for instance, uh, so many uh, dancers from Eastern Europe, which in the early, in the 1920s and 30s is going through an extremely difficult time economically and Cairo is going through a very sort of boom time economically. So lots of people come from Eastern Europe to Cairo, uh, amongst them, a lot of women who are exploited. Um, so that's part of the ethnic dimension uh, to it, uh, but there's there's lots of different levels of it, and it also plays into this kind of nationalist uh, discourse that starts to come a little. We saw it a little bit with uh, the character of Paralumbo in that play uh, that is, you know, foreigners uh, have come in. They own a lot of bars, nightclubs, uh, and uh, are exploiting Egyptians too. I mean, so I think that's there's that level uh, in the nationalist discourse, uh, but there's also uh, various different levels of uh, of exploitation amongst women and amongst different nationalities and, and backgrounds. And yeah, I'll just say again that I think that might be one of the reasons why so many women why there's so much more diversity amongst the female performers than the male ones. That's fantastic. And it's also, it seems in the case, and you can give us examples of, let's say, for instance, uh, Manolis Ioannidis marrying an Egyptian, and new identities also, hybrid identities. So that's particularly interesting as well as the politics and uh, discussion of national uh, change. Uh, next question uh, from John Xiros Cooper. Uh, thank you for the informative talk. The Cairo Theatre and Nightclub District is rather strictly limited to a certain area of the city. Do you have any idea what cultural relationship there was between the area and the wider civic space? Or even in the case of other smaller cities like Mansoura, for example? The, I, so yeah, the Cairo, the district is, is in a very certain area. There is another a uh, sort of nightlife district in Cairo called Rodel Farag, which used to have, which was sort of a, uh, seen as a sort of second tier, perhaps sometimes, perhaps the summer district that people would also perform in. So it's not just Esbukair, but Esbukair is certainly the um, the most important. And it's, um, it, it gets a very bad reputation in, in the late 19th century. It has a particularly bad reputation when, when uh, considered compared to other areas of the city. There's actually a good book on this which came out by, well, actually, probably came out a couple of years ago, by Joseph Ben Prestel, in which uh, he compares, and we'll see if I can find, uh, find it, in which he compares Berlin and Cairo in the late 19th century uh, and sees you know, how these kind of entertainment districts in, bo in both cities rise up and how they're talked about. And in Cairo, it's very much seen as a place. I'm going to see if I can put this in the chat box because I did copy it, but I don't know how to. Um, I'll do that in a second. It's seen as a place really where um, people are corrupted, and it's a place where here, let me put it here. There we go. Uh, the youth of the uh, of the nation kind of go and spend all their money on gambling and on women and on booze and uh, lots of people write these kind of tracts against it and poems and it as an area just takes on this uh, kind of sense that it's corrupting uh, the rest of the city uh, and so one thing which i didn't really mention kind of in the talk but is important to note uh, is that what we're talking about here is is very much a counterculture, uh, and and it's criticised a lot uh, by the more sort of respectable bourgeois members of uh, Egyptian society. Uh, less uh, by the twenties and thirties, it's it's becoming a little more respected, uh, but still, it's always a, a counterculture, and maybe uh, part of the reason for um, its sort of cosmopolitan openness, which despite all its problems, I think it really did have, is that it is a counterculture and it's not really part of this uh, uh, construction of uh, bourgeois nationality. Thank you so much. And we have a follow-up uh, from uh, Nasvada. Uh, to what extent we can talk about a free and liberal space for these performances? 
were there any mechanisms of state control or censorship with regards to the nightlife? Uh, yeah, there were, there were, and, and a good, uh, good follow-up to that, like, as well as being criticized in the press, I mean, this area, laws are passed, some of them feel, uh, feel like, feel very strange uh, to our current sort of uh, ears, so one of the most prominent ones was, it was illegal to belly dance um, in, in Egypt in the 1920s, it wasn't illegal to dance, but this thing called belly dancing, uh, had been outlawed, and there's an extremely sort of complex uh, history to that, uh, which is, in my interpretation at least, basically because in the late 19th century, lots of people go to these uh, world's fairs in places like Chicago is a famous one, and in Paris. Uh, they import lots of Arabic performers who they say are Egyptian. Sometimes they are Egyptian, but usually they tend to be from all over the Arab world, North Africa. Uh, the Levant, the rest of it, uh, but they put on these Egyptian street performances and they put on belly dances and audiences go and sort of gawk at the belly dancers and they're all very exotic and everyone likes them but thinks they're debauched. Um, and so belly dance and Egypt uh, in the sort of European consciousness are really thrown together as this sort of place of decadence and loose morals and people in Egypt hear about this, obviously, they know what's going on, they read the articles, uh, and they don't particularly like it, um, the way that they're being portrayed. So, um, uh, so they complain, they complain a lot about that, and in, in the, the press in Egypt complains a lot about how Egypt is portrayed at these fairs as a place of dancing. And at the same time, belly dance is banned in the nightclubs. I, I would put those two together, although I haven't really been able to establish a direct connection because they use the Arabic word rock cell button, which is like literally means dance of the belly, which had not existed before, um, you know, these exhibitions before dance du vent had become a thing. So it's really a translation from that and a way to sort of clamp down on them. Uh, yeah, this type of performance, which they see as giving Egypt a bad name throughout the world. Uh, and there's lots of censorship uh, that is actually related to that kind of uh, concern that Egypt is being shown in a bad light. So in when theater, when film crews come, there's often calls to censor what they film in Egypt because they think that their the film crews are coming to Egypt to present it in a bad light, uh, which is quite often true. Um, but uh, there are a lot of calls to censor that, as well as increasing censorship of the theater there's always a kind of, there's a back and forth and there's various different levels on which it works and people push at it and that kind of thing, but it's, it's definitely always there. That's fantastic. I can't thank you enough uh, for this wonderful presentation. We look forward to reading the book. Uh, I want to thank our co-sponsors and the audience members for their questions and their participation. And I want to invite you all to join us again tomorrow, uh, Saturday, September 25th at 10 a.m. Uh, for a talk by Dr. Marina Schina from the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki for her talk, uh, Byron's Romantic Philhellenism. The lecture is a joint event co-sponsored by the SNF Center for Hellenic Studies, UCLA's SNF Center for, uh, Center for the Study of Hellenic Culture, and the Embassy of Greece in the USA. And uh, we'll discuss the changing aspects of Lord Byron's Philalism as they were acted out in his lifetime and expressed through his poetic production. For those of you who are interested in registering, please uh, check our website, sfu.ca, Hellenic Studies, or send an email to hscom uh, at sfu.ca. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you, Dr. Cormack. Uh, and we hope to invite you soon uh, here yeah. To, to, yeah. to Vancouver. Thank you very much. Have a great evening, afternoon all. Thank you so much. Yeah.